Before learning how the domain name system works, it's important to understand a little of its history, including what preceded it and the problems it was designed to solve. That's what we'll look at in this short chapter. Before DNS, back in the time of the ARPANET, there was the host table, often called hosts.txt. This was a single monolithic file that mapped the names of all the hosts on the ARPANET to their IP addresses, and it was maintained by a single organization, the Network Information Center, which was run by SRI International up in Menlo Park, California. It was distributed from a single host called SRI-NIC. Here's a snippet from host.txt. The format isn't too different from the format of the Unix Etsy hosts file or the Windows host.txt file, if you're familiar with those. Each line contains information about a single host, including its IP address in the second field, the host's canonical or official name in the beginning of the third field, optionally followed by one or more aliases, then the hardware that ran the host, the operating system it ran, and finally, a list of services it supported. The sharp-eyed among you may notice an important nuance about this file. The hosts appear in no particular order, not sorted by IP address or host name. Network administrators on the ARPANET would submit their portions of host.txt to the NIC, which would aggregate them into a single file and make that file available via FTP. As the ARPANET grew, though, this scheme developed all kinds of problems. One was latency. The file was only updated twice a week, so it could be days before your brand new host was actually accessible over the ARPANET. The amount of bandwidth consumed by folks sending updates to the NIC and downloading the host table was considerable. Remember, in the early days, the pipes that constituted the backbone of the ARPANET ran at 56 kilobits per second. Though IP networks could be assigned in a way that allowed network administrators to dole out individual IP addresses without consulting a central authority, host names couldn't be assigned the same way. You had to search the host table for name collisions before naming a host, and all the good names, like Frodo, Bilbo, and Gandalf, were quickly used up. The file got big, too. When I took over HP.com, Hewlett Packard's internal host table was nearly 100,000 lines long, and the ARPANET's host table was much larger than that. Searching the file took a long time because, of course, you had to search it linearly. It wasn't sorted. And at HP, on some of our slower computers, the search would actually time out before reaching the end of the file. Some administrators took to sorting the file so that frequently looked up hosts were near the top. So work began to design a successor to the host table. Paul Macapetris, then at the University of Southern California's Information Sciences Institute, was largely responsible for the design of the domain name system. The chief design goals were to allow local administration of partitions of an overall host naming database, but to make those partitions available globally, that is, across the entire ARPANET, and to use a hierarchical namespace which would allow easy partitioning of the database and ensure the uniqueness of host names. Here's a look at a timeline of DNS history over the past 30-odd years. You can see that the scale along the horizontal axis is not particularly accurate. The first RFCs, Request for Comments Documents, to describe DNS were published by Makapetris back in 1983. And the ARPANET made the transition from the host table to DNS between their publication in 1984. In 1984, the first version of BIND, the preeminent open source implementation of the DNS specs, came out. It was BIND 4. Makapetris updated the core DNS RFCs in 1987 to RFCs 1032 through 1034, upon which the current version of DNS is actually still based. The Microsoft DNS server, a popular DNS server that's bundled with Microsoft's Windows Server operating systems, came out in 1993. Bind 8, a rewritten version of Bind, came out in 1997, followed by another major overhaul, Bind 9, in 2000. And we're actually still running versions of Bind 9 on the internet today. Thanks for watching this O'Reilly training video. If you'd like more information on this topic, click on Learn More. Don't forget to subscribe to the O'Reilly Video Training YouTube channel for more tutorials. And be sure to like us on Facebook.